relationships to this world. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming. I wanted to thank the hospital for uh, uh, inviting me today. And so the, the message of today's lecture is that we eat too much carbohydrate. Now, some of you may agree with what I'm going to talk about today. Some of you may disagree, but to be honest, it's, it's all good. The point is that it's a new way to look at nutrition, and I believe that that makes it important. Now, to get here, the hospital actually um, has to do some critical review of my slides. And um, Susan Labat, who unfortunately isn't here, I, I was hoping she would be here, um, is a uh, registered dietitian, and she critically reviewed my lecture. And she made some excellent comments, and I've actually made some changes and inclusions in the, in the slides that we'll, we'll dis discuss today. So uh, to start, I'd like to just summarize. Um, I'm going to uh, present us with some, um, some data, some terminology, uh, then we'll look at the history of nutrition as it relates to uh, obesity. Uh, we'll discuss the science of ins insulin resistance and inflammation. Um, then we're going to discuss the management, uh, treatment of patients. We're going to compare diets, which is kind of fun. I'm going to give some patient cases and, and we'll summarize with nutrition guidelines. So I have no financial relationships. So uh, we have this twin, e twin epidemic that we call diabetes, and this came out um, from Shape Up America in 2000, and this was uh, Dr. Everett C. C. Coop, this is his group. And um, I love that terminology, and basically it states that there's this relationship between weight gain, obesity, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and inflammation, and that th these are basically uh, two of the same thing that are, are happening at the same time. And it's a progressive uh, condition. And so uh, we have some t statistics, and I get my statistics from the Trust for America's Health. Um, and I update this slide every year, and unfortunately we see the obesity s statistics creep up. And um, they give us an F as in fat, a, a failing grade, and the statistics uh, from actually 2009 data are that 68% of adults are overweight and obese. 34% um, of um, uh, the, the national data uh, patients are obese. And that's slightly different than the state data, but this is the group that tells us that Colorado is the leanest state at 19.1%. But I tell you, if um, healthcare professionals were able to, to deal with those 19.1% uh, of the patients in the state, um, we'd be quite busy. So it, it still is a big issue here in Colorado. And um, when we look at the rates from 1980 to 2008, the obesity rates have doubled. Um, and the child obesity statistics are, are, um, are concerning. We can, we can see the rates have tripled, and now 18% of our children are under age um, 18, I believe, are um, overweight or obese. So let's look at the statistics of insulin resistance. In the previous slide, I just mentioned that 68% of uh, adults are overweight. Well, I believe that that actually represents a, a statistic also of insulin resistance. 25% um, pre-diabetic, 39% metabolic syndrome. And we'll talk about metabolic syndrome a little. What's confusing to me is that there's more criteria for metabolic syndrome, one of which is pre-diabetes, and I actually think those statistics should be reversed. But um, Perhaps I'm just a messenger here, and that's the data that I found. 8% um, is diabetic now, and again, that's creeping up, and I think that's an underestimation. 25% um, uh, of our population over age 60 are diabetic, and in my office, we do a lot of screening, and this is no surprise to me that we have patients over age 65 that come in, and I don't like to do this, but I say, oh, and by the way, you're diabetic. No one ever told me that, doctor. Um, uh, and then there's an estimate that one in three children uh, born today will be diabetic, so that 8% number will become 33% in 40 years, but not if I can help it. So let's look at the, uh, the history of nutrition as it uh, relates to obesity. So traditionally, um, we thought of obesity as a not a medical condition. It's not necessarily related to health. I'm, I'm just overweight and I need to do something about it. And it, 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 it's a personal choice issue. You, you, you became overweight because of the lifestyle 
that you chose to leave. It's your fault. You need to feel guilty about it, and you need to do something about it. And as a result of this thinking, we, we developed the billion dollar weight loss industry. And Weight Watchers is a great example that developed in the 1960s. And the science of the time was um, counting calories, fat is bad, and carbohydrates are, are OK. Uh, but more important is it, it's designed to pay out of pocket. If you're overweight, it's your problem. So we have um, government agencies that participate. Um, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and, and, and the Health and Human Service Department that come up with nutritional guidelines. And these guidelines really start post-World War II. Uh, we have basic food groups, and then a scientist, Ansel Keys, in the 1950s, who was actually born in Colorado Springs, um, develops the lipid hypothesis. And that hypothesis is that if we eat fat, we get fat, and it's going to lead to cardiovascular disease. Now, there's one, that, well, there are major flaws in this study. What he originally did was look at several countries around the world, and, and he threw out the countries that did, did not fit him into his hypothesis. So his hypothesis was, if you eat fat, you're going to get um, cardiovascular disease. So he threw out countries where they, they had a high-fat diet, I think, in Scandinavia, and a low incidence of heart disease. And he said, well, that didn't fit the data. So he threw it out. It all looked perfect. He got written up in Time Magazine. And it was a snowball effect. And he was really the father of uh, low-fat diets. And the one problem that I have also with his work, and every single study that looks at um, dietary fat consumption, is the assumption is that there's not a problem with the carbohydrates. So they don't even, sometimes they don't even report the quantity of carbohydrates consumed in the study when they draw the conclusion. And that, that, that really is um, a bad assumption. And it makes the, the studies invalid. So uh, then we have the McGovern report. Then in 1980, we come up with additional dietary guidelines. It says to decrease fat, increase carbohydrates. Um, as a result of that, we get the food pyramids, um, which again are, are carbohydrate uh, heavy. And um, the fundamental principles at this time are, again, if you eat fat, you'll get fat. And also, this, this idea of the conservation of energy, that if I just eat less and exercise more, I'm going to lose weight. And this, this theory is based on um, um, the physics of a calorie in, a calorie out, if we burn a calorie in a petri dish. And it just assumes that our, our bodies are petri dishes. But we're missing one point. We are human biologic systems. And um, it is the way that our hormones react to the foods that we consume that determine what we do with that energy. And so it's, it's not necessarily about this conservation of energy. But it's these two fundamental principles that we've just stuck with for the past 60 years. And again, um, it was based on the science of the times, but I think we know uh, a lot more. So then we have the healthcare industry where we're at today. And um, it's... Um, the healthcare industry really, are, the guidelines are set by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and initially, they say that we are here to treat disease only. And since obesity isn't a medical condition, we're not going to deal with it. it. It's not our problem. That becomes an issue for uh, public health. And of course, we know now Medicare and Medicaid are. are, are have had a lot of pressure to bring in preventive programs. And it, it's getting better, but it's still a long way off. But the, the big point is that they set the guidelines for the industry. And those guidelines are that there's no incentive for, for healthcare professionals to um, discuss nutrition or obesity with their patients. We're not going to pay for it, so why should we learn about it? And that's exactly what happened to me in medical school. You know, I learned about the ATP cycle, I, the Krebs cycle, I learned some science, but yeah, actual application, there was nothing. And so I had to go out on my own and learn about it. And surely there's something wrong with that. <laughs> okay, so what is- this Is this still the case? There's no, there's, you can't, there's no coding for you to do counseling about obesity? It's a great question. So the um, insurance industry doesn't like to pay for coding related to um, obesity. And so you have to find they don't like that code, so you have to find 
other codes such as cholesterol, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome. And again, that's, that's silly. There's really something wrong with that. So nutritional guidelines are not working. And some more about that is it's interesting to note that um, human diet has been different for 99% of our existence. That's um, um, 500,000 or 500 million years. Um, and um, we started out as hunter-gatherers where we were eating primarily a, a high-protein, high-fat diet. And what, what changed in the last 250 years is um, farming and agriculture and introduction of um, inexpensive and unhealthy foods. But I would um, specifically look at the grain, wheat, and the corn products as, as the problem food. And so it's hard to change this common sense thinking. And there's, there's all these word fights out there as to what's, what's healthy nutrition, uh, balance, moderation, low fat, low carb, watch your protein. Boy, that sounds like this, just, let's stop eating. So I'm even confused when, when people throw these terms around. I don't even know what they mean anymore. Um, and let's just say there's social pressure to, to live unhealthy without going into it too much. Um, and then we have the health care industry, which unfortunately is reactive versus proactive. And by that I mean uh, we, we're spending billions of dollars treating the complications of obesity and not treating the cause, obesity itself and nutrition. And certainly this would be a cost-effective uh, approach. And this is where the term fat reform before health reform comes up, or if you don't like that term, you can use, say food reform. But the idea is if we want to, if we want to reform our healthcare system, we have to look at lifestyle first. Um, and that includes reforming the food industry and, and, and the information that they're pumping out. So uh, today's challenge, it's very easy to state the challenges on this slide, but it's very hard to make the changes. And so the challenges are to redefine healthy nutrition, to promote wellness and longevity, to prevent and treat this disease, and control the cost of health care. And the tools that we're going to use are the, are the lessons from the past, and we're going to look to modern science and evidence-based medicine um, for answers. And the science is out of insulin resistance and inflammation. And so it's like uh, Sherlock Holmes would, would say if he was alive today, it's elementary, my dear Watson. The problem is with the food. And so it is um, insulin resistance, which again provides the clues and the answers. Now, what's interesting is the um, uh, in, um, insulin metabolism, we've known about it, how it's functions, all the details since the 1960s, and how it responds to carbohydrate. But, but, but what's new is, is applying the science of insulin resistance to nutrition. And that's what we're going to do here today. So some of the medical or scientific things that we're going to talk about is, number one, food, food physiology, and that is how the macronutrients uh, interact with um, the body, and the macronutrients being the fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And the medical conditions that we like to discuss today are uh, insulin resistance, and it's important to recognize insulin resistance as this progressive condition where um, weight gain is the first sign. Um, adipose organ toxicity, inflammation, energy storage disease, we're going to talk about those as well. So we'll talk about insulin in the pancreas. So what does insulin do? In medical school, they taught us that it regulates blood sugar. Yes, that is true. But that's actually a secondary effect. What insulin really does is it regulates energy in the body as we consume. It decides, it decides if it wants to burn it. It decides if we want to store that energy. Um, and it is the food that triggers the production of insulin. And the beta cells are in, that, uh, pan are in the pancreas. And they are most sensitive to dietary carbohydrates. Why? Because it's a simple form of energy. Uh, we consider a carbohydrate or glucose the first source of energy. And uh, think about the concept that as we consume carbohydrates, it turns on that insulin switch. Um, dietary fat and protein are really considered a second source of energy because it has to be processed. And again, this is by human design. Again, we talked about the 500 million years of uh, human existence. 
So we have uh, insulin receptors that are on both uh, lean and fat tissue throughout the body, and they respond to this um, uh, increased uh, insulin message. And when insulin rises, it goes to the receptors. It says that there's energy available for a nutrients, and, and the tissues will, will absorb that uh, energy. Now, what else happens is if there's excess food, insulin sends message to the fat tissue that there's excess energy, and uh, the, the body fat, it will be stored as body fat. And what's important to realize is our body fat is this unlimited uh, storage space that can keep growing and growing. And this is compared to glycogen storage, which is limited in uh, liver and uh, lean muscle. Uh, so glycogen stores contribute less to insul insulin resistance it plays in, but the reverse happens as insulin goes up, glucagon uh, tends to go down. That's produced by the alpha cells in the pancreas. And, and the message there is storage. Every, we're in storage mode. Now, insulin will normally suppress appetite, and that makes sense as, um, as we eat, um, we're filling ourselves up. Insulin rises, and, and the message is, okay, we're full. We're filling up. So a normal state appetite will be suppressed. And so when food is unavailable, the reversal happens. So insulin drops, glucagon rises, and, and the message there is, okay, there's, there's less food available. We're going to rely on our, our energy stores uh, for, for energy. Um, and again, it is dietary carbohydrates that, that are the primary trigger, either its presence or its absence. So now we, we start overeating. Uh, what happens? So the excess energy, especially the carbohydrates, are stored as body fat. And uh, we now start to gain weight, and this creates a uh, larger body mass. And this now tells the beta cells, we better produce more insulin because we have more body mass. And so we produce more insulin, and that creates more storage of energy and more body fat deposition. And eventually, with time, the, the, those insulin receptors actually become strained and overstimulated, and they become resistant to this uh, the, the insulin uh, message. Um, the beta cells get strained, um, and they lose their normal response to uh, uh, their normal response, and, and it, the insulin levels get even higher. And we have this pro paradoxical increase in glucagon again. If insulin goes up, glucagon normally goes down, and now glucagon starts to go up, and the alpha cells are strained. And the way to explain this, um, this um, uh, resistance or, or the strain is like a, um, a sticky or sluggish gas pedal on, on the car. So you come to a stop sign and, uh, or, or stoplight and it turns green and you push the gas pedal, nothing happens. So you push it harder and then you know, it's sluggish and then the, then the car lunges forward and then you realize that there was too much, uh, I put too, too much gas into it and so I let off the gas. And, and so basically, it's, it's like pumping the insulin out in, 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 a, in, a, in a regular way, is what I'm trying to explain. Um, and what develops is this vicious, vicious insulin uh, cycle. And, um, and explain, I'll explain in a second how the, the fat cells are actually starving the rest of the body. And as well, it also drives our hunger and appetite. And so this is that vicious cycle. We gain weight. It causes insulin resistance. We increase our insulin production, and we continue to gain weight. It's, we call it the spiral of death. Another way to explain that is on the left, this is a, a normal individual. The green arrows are normal insulin production. Here's the fat cells. And then in their insulin resistance state, we're now pumping out more insulin everywhere. Most of the insulin is going to the, the fat cells, which have now doubled in size. We have uh, insulin resistance everywhere in the body. And basically, insulin and energy is now being fed to fat tissues. And literally, the fat tissues are starving the body. And so the, as we gain weight, we actually lose our energy. And it's, and it's often difficult to get overweight people to exercise because they're literally starving themselves. OK, so I said it drives hunger and appetite. Um, and so again, it's this pathologic fluctuation in our in, insulin levels that now, as insulin rises, we're, it, it's actually stimulating appetite. So it's actually doing the opposite of what it's supposed to do. And um, this is all working in the, um, ener the energy or the hunger centers of our brain, the hypothalamus. It becomes resistance itself. And 
we actually lose central satiety. And all we have left are, are peripheral signals of um, feeling full. And that's this swollen, um, stop bloated abdomen, and especially carbs no longer suppress appetite. And this concept that we're just a bottomless pit and we can, we can eat. And I always um, mention um, um, the, the holidays where, or Thanksgiving, where we, we overeat and our stomachs are so bloated that, and then we have to go to bed. We call that the food coma. But these overweight patients, their only signal is the bloated abdomen that they're full. And I, I call it the metabolic abdomen, and that's just an unhealthy uh, sense of fullness. Now, there's many other hormones and peptides that can contribute with both hunger, appetite, and insulin resistance. But insulin is, 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 this, is known the best, so we talk about insulin. But um, it is worth mentioning some of the other um, hormones and peptides. And I know this slide is complicated, but basically the point here is that we have um, all these hormones and peptides that really affect hunger centers. And this is really the research of the next 10 years. Um, in fact, we have drugs now such as GLP-1, um, amylin mimetics that, are, that have been in the market for the last five or six years that um, basically use them and, and they treat insulin resistance and they suppress appetite. So this, this is exciting for the future. So let's talk about inflammation. And so we have um, this, this concept now where the fat tissue is, a, is an organ. And unfortunately, that organ is inflammatory and toxic. And we think of it as the gas tank is poisoning us. And it releases toxic substances um, that fuel infl inflammation and insulin resistance. It's toxic everywhere in the body. Um, as we gain weight, uh, we have circulating triglycerides and free fatty acids that are directly toxic to our, our bodies. And we, um, the, the, the um, adipose tissue is releasing uh, hormones or cytokines, of which 95% of them are harmful, unfortunately. And this basically leads to these, these concepts of inflammation, energy storage disease, which I'll talk about, and um, insulin resistance is just one component. And, so on the next slide, this is just a different way to look at this condition where the problem is fat, fat storage. The fat cells are here in the center of the universe and they're releasing all these toxic substances. Um, actually, ad adiponectin is, is um, paradoxically decreasing and this is the one healthy component that's, that's released and it, and it drops. And there's a lot to this slide. We could spend hours talking about it. But, uh, the point is that uh, it's about uh, fat storage, energy, energy storage, and so the term energy storage disease, which I can't find much in the literature, but I love that term. And so I believe that you know when we talk about inflammation, insulin resistance, energy storage disease, it's one and the same. And this all leads to basically all the diseases in, in that modern society. And if we take it one step further, this slide basically illustrates some more of those associated conditions related to inflammation, energy storage disease. And basically, this is why we're here as healthcare professionals. We're treating all these diseases in modern society. And if I left anything out, just, just name one and we'll put it in the next presentation <laughs> because it's all connected. And so um, there's this one specific condition, metabolic syndrome, that um, if you have this, you're at an increased risk for uh, heart disease. And I, I just show this here, and so patients have, um, they're obese, they have hyperlipidemia, they have high blood pressure, prediabetes, and it predisposes them to, to heart disease. So let's talk about evaluation. The first thing to understand is that it's a progressive condition from being overweight to eventually being type 2 diabetes. And the best measurement in my office is body measurements, weight, height, BMI, BMI body fat, waist circumference. Um, of course, we want to get a, a, a full family, his, uh, a medical history, a family history. We want to determine it, uh, the other comorbid conditions that we have to treat, and we have to identify patients at risk. And it's very easy to identify patients at risk, since two-thirds of the population have, have this issue. Um, what we like to do is um, the OGT or the glucose tolerance test, the two-hour OGT in our office. The American Diabetes Association and Medicare are recommending uh, using this as a screening tool 
not only do we use it, use it as a screening tool, we use it as a crude tool to actually stage insulin resistance. Now, um, the, the, the researchers would scream at me for doing this because they have more elaborate methods, glucose, clamp, homa, and quickie, where we don't have the resources in the clinical practice to do the, that type of blood work and testing. But um, we use the OGT, um, we do three measurements, and, and the three of um, the number is how we stage the insulin resistance. And uh, I keep a database since this is what I'm interested in now. I've done over 700 uh, uh, OGTs in my office, and it's all, often fun to look at uh, one patient and compare how the OGT changes with time. Um, we want to uh, measure markers of inflammation, and basically it's a metabolic syndrome evaluation. So hemoglobin A1C screening, um, I've been doing that for 10 years. And in, um, Susan, as I had mentioned before, wanted me to specifically say that in 2009, the ADA now has uh, recommended it as a screening tool. And that's great. We've been doing it. We get, we get much more information with OGT, but the question is if you have time in your office to do that. Um, we measure C-peptides, lipids, CRP, whatever you want, but the idea is that these, to me, they're markers of inflammation. And it is the degree of insulin resistance that, and the beta cell dis dysfunction that directs our treatment. So, how do we treat it? And this is fun. Um, they taught me how to prescribe medicine, but, and I still do that, but, but when we look at this condition, it is the food, is, is the medicine. It's the lifestyle that we're modifying first. And how do we do this? We remove the primary fuel, which is the carbohydrate. And what does it do? It turns off the insulin switch. Stored energy is re released from the adipose tissue. That promotes lipolysis or something called healthy ketosis. Um, and we, um, we lose weight, we empty the gas tank, and it becomes uh, anti-inflammatory. This again will control hunger and appetite. It increases our sense of fullness. And um, we actually go through carbohydrate withdrawal initially, and we joke with patients that we're signing them up to the uh, Carboholics Anonymous program. And you can literally think of carbohydrates as the drug of choice, and we're trying to rehab them off of that. And so they go through withdrawal. And what we do during that time is encourage patients to, to eat um, uh, uh, healthy, high-fat, high-protein foods, drink a lot of fluids, and they feel terrible, and we tell them that's a positive response because you've made changes to your diet. And I know that as the body begins to burn body fat, instead of relying on dietary carbohydrates, that withdrawal will go away. So we need to support them during that period of time. Um, again, we are gonna be eating less carbohydrates, and so we're gonna regulate those in insulin levels, and we're gonna control our appetite, and um, the patients will lose weight. So this is an important slide. Um, so again, diet, we want to talk about the other macronutrients. So the dietary fats and proteins. Again, they're not the inflammatory fuels because they don't stimulate the insulin like carbohydrates do. And by default, you're going to increase the fat and protein in your diet. And then the important part is about the fats. Fats are not so bad. And this is, this is one of the sticking points for 60 years. So we all agree now that there are these monounsaturated fats uh, essential fatty acids that, that are healthy. Um, the reason that fats are good is that it promotes satiety. And the big point, or the major point here is that again, fat is not the primary fuel for this condition. So why have we spent 60 years focusing on fat consumption? Okay? Um, so um, we all agree that there's some problems with trans fats. And, and this is another punchline here is that it is actually the combination of fats, cholesterol, and carbs in the diet that, that, that is, that's a killer. And the way I explain that to my patients is that if my patient says, you know, I'd like to have a cheese omelet in the morning, I say, that's fine, go have a cheese omelet. The problem is what we typically eat the cheese omelet with, and it's all the carbohydrates. So um, toast, hash brown potatoes, pancakes, maple syrup, orange juice. So as soon as we combine those foods, we now raise what's called the glycemic index of the meal, and I'll explain that. We turn on the ins insulin switch, which is the message now to store that food, and we drop dead from a heart attack. So another way to say it is the combination of the, uh, the carbs, fat, um, and, and cholesterol in the diet that, that is a killer. And so 
We don't want to do that. And um, of course, we need healthy, healthy protein so that you don't use, lose your muscle mass as you're losing weight. So there is medication. Again, we start first with the food. But when we talk about medication, we're looking at physiologic medication that really mimics what the body normally do, does. And specifically in type 2 and pre-diabetics, we have these newer medications. I, I again explained about the GLP-1 and the amylin my, my medics by Ada Victosa and Similin are, to me, revolutionary drugs. They're smart, they're smart hormonal drugs that basically um, affect every aspect of, the, of, of um, the cascade that we were talking about. Metformin is an older drug uh, that we've used in diabetics that has a slight effect on, on weight loss. Um, there are, of course, the appetite suppressants, but that's not the, 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 the primary focus of what we do here. And then there's the future, and uh, that holds a lot of promise. There's over-the-counter market, and just to say, it, you know, there, there may be some good and, some, and definitely some bad things there. Uh, we're going to treat the comorbid conditions, and, and of course, you know, I, I have my arsenal of medication, which I still use when, when I need to. but. What's important is understand that these conditions are, are all connected, and it's a new approach where we're treating inflammation. We're not treating the cholesterol independently, the hypertension independently. We're, we're treating it all as one. Um, and it brings us back to the lifestyle, which does address everything. And then, of course, there's bariatric surgery um, if all else fails. But the point here, what's interesting is that when you do bariatric surgery, it, the, the GLP levels go sky high, so it does does something very interesting to the hormones to suppress appetite. So we want to teach our, pers our patients how to focus on the carbohydrate content of food, and so we have some tools. And so the first tool is the glycemic index. What is that? That's the measurement of a food's ability to rapidly raise blood sugar. So foods that have a high glycemic index are bad. Now, unfortunately, it is not on the food label. Uh, maybe it will be in 10 years. But what you can do is print out charts I, on my website, and I have a, link, uh, a, a reference to it at the end. Uh, I have uh, three or four glycemic index charts, glycemic load. I have too much information on my website if you're interested. But so basically, this is actually a revised uh, guideline. And the reason it's revised is um, the, the glycemic index guideline came out in 2002 from the University of Sin Sydney. They're the people that invented this. And I don't, they weren't really thinking about carbohydrate restriction like the way I think about it. And so they initially say that foods that have an index under 55 are healthy. And I'm saying that that's too generous. And so I have my patients focus on foods that have an index under 30. And you can ba we basically break it down into thirds. And um, that's, that, I don't have time really to go into it much more than that. Um, then we have glycemic index, which is really the glycemic, in, uh, glycemic load, rather, which is the glycemic index times the grams of carbohydrates. And so the point there is that watermelon, for instance, it actually has a high glycemic index, but it has very little sugar in it. And, and, and so therefore, we'd say, well, okay, you know, based on glycemic load, watermelon wouldn't be that bad. But, and if you want to focus on glycemic load, you can. But my, my issue with it is that glycemic load allows you to eat more foods that you would otherwise not eat if you focused on glycemic index only. The next tool is carbohydrate gram counting. And the point here is that the more you restrict carbohydrates, the more rapid your weight loss will be. Now, I, I, I actually added this because uh, Susan, again, had me um, uh, made some comments about what the American Diabetes Association is, is doing. They, in 2008, have recognized that carbohydrates are, are, are an issue. And that's, that's great that they recognized it. And what they said is that, as a start, we can restrict carbohydrates down to 130 grams a day um, because they're afraid to go lower. <laughs> um, but this is actually a start uh, for my patients. In other words, if I have patients maintain weight, <laughs> I, I usually start at 120 to 130 grams of carbs per day. Uh, the ADA uh, uses what's called the food exchange, um, which, is, um, which is interesting. The basis of it is first the carbohydrate content of the food. Then they look also at um, uh, fats, 
calories, and they really, you know, still are using this concept of balance. And, and I look at it that they have a lot of pressure from, from all over the place in terms of coming up with nutritional guidelines. Now, in my office, I can I I have the ability to to to, to go off um, what what the official guidelines are, and so I think that um, it's good. It's going in the right direction, but it still needs a little bit more more work. Um, but then again, um, we break it down into you know three levels of carbohydrate restriction, and under 40 to 45 grams, um, which you might consider extreme carbohydrate restriction, but I, I don't like to use that term because this is where you have to be to help patients lose weight. This, because again, carbohydrates aren't healthy. But as you further restrict carbs, it causes rapid weight loss in this concept of healthy ketosis. And um, this is the state where the body is just burning body fat so fast that it, that it releases um, ketones. And this is in contrast to diabetic ketoacidosis, which is an unhealthy state where insulin levels are sky high. The body is, is, um, is, is not responding to insulin, and it's just burning body fat, and, and, and it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's an unhealthy state, as opposed to healthy ketosis, where sugar levels are controlled. We're restricting carbohydrate consumption, and we're burning body fat in a healthy way. And again, what's important for our patients to understand that the quantity, calories, and portions are less, and less important. What we're trying to do is regulate insulin, not the calories that we consume. Again, another fundamental um, concept that we're saying is a little bit different today. And um, we're trying to help patients lose weight by eating versus starving, or not eating. So, um, evaluating diets, and what we want to do is compare the macronutrient contents in the diet. And um, so, uh, I, at the two extremes, we have uh, the very uh, low-fat, high-carb diets, such as um, Pritikin and Dean Ornish diet. On the other extreme, we have the very high-fat, very low-carb diet, uh, the Atkins or the Bernstein diet, and then we have everything in between. Um, I have a link to a tool that you can plug in different diets and it gives you the percents of mac macronutrients. Now some patients are interested in that. As a healthcare professional, I'm very interested in it. So I like to compare diets like that. So what health, what diets are healthy and safe? And so we support anything that works. And we want to monitor our patients. And so what's the message here? And the message is that low carb diets improve health. And by that, I mean that the markers of inflammation improve. And we have many studies, and I've mentioned three in the last 10 years, that are randomized, well-controlled studies comparing diets that demonstrate this. And so this is the um, uh, diet A to Z study, um, weight loss study, that again, a randomized trial from Stanford. That was the first one that I mentioned. And so they looked at four diets. We have. Um, on, on the low carb side, we have Atkins, then it goes to Zone, Learn, and then the low fat is the Ornish diet. What's interesting is that this was a group of 250 women that they studied over a year, which is a short period of time. And everyone did what the diets were telling them to do. So these um, three diets here were really um, calories, consumed, played into it, and so the patients had to monitor their calories. Whereas Atkins was low carb, and, and traditionally they, they, they tell patients to eat until they're full, but they're not regulating calories. So what happened is that the calories consumed were equal. Everyone started eating, at the beginning, before the diet, they were eating more calories. As they went into the diet, everyone ate less calories, but in the Atkins, they were eating all these high fat, high protein, they too ended up reducing their caloric intake without even worrying about it. And they were eating all this fat. They, and, the, and you think, well, okay, all those fat calories, will they be eating more calories? No, well, some, the way the study worked, that you know, calories were basically controlled throughout the patient groups. And what happened is that the Atkins people, on the bottom here, they lost more weight in six months than 12 months. So it'd be nice to take this out and, and, and go further. Uh, so what about markers of inflammation? So, oops, 
So they, um, they looked at cholesterol as terms of markers for inflammation. And so what was determined is in the Atkins group is that the HDL went up higher than any of the other groups. Here's the HDL in the Atkins. The Ornish is at the bottom in terms of the HDL. Triglycerides went way up, or way down rather, 29% reduction in triglycerides. And the other ones weren't even close. Now the one thing that did go slightly up was the LDL. And in the, in the Ornish you can see LDL went down. And so if, if you traditionally look at cholesterol, you say, okay, well the Dean Ornish diet was much better because the LDL you know, dropped. But the, the, the message that I'd like to convey is that there's new science in terms of cholesterol. And we have to look at HDL. We have to look at triglyceride. We have to look at a new concept called particle size, where, where they now um, break down um, the, uh, the cholesterol. They run it through a centrifuge. And, and now it's the science of particle size, where um, the, the fluffy LDL particle A uh, confers a four times less risk of heart disease than the unhealthy particle B. And so this study suggested from other studies that they were suspecting the particle size went to the fluffy, healthy pattern A. And they're now looking at uh, statin medication and, and low-fat diets, looking at particle size. And unfortunately, it looks like it doesn't have that great of, of an effect on particle size, whereas the the low-carb diets do. And to illustrate that, this is from another study, and I would just refer you to um, the bottom of the slide. And as, as the triglycerides drop, LDL particle size increases. So it's, it's just a normal physiologic response. And this just shows um, uh, VLDL is basically the, what carries triglycerides. So VLDL drops as triglycerides drop, but particle size increases. And so the more and more I read about cholesterol, the more and more I'm confused, and the more and more I read and I try to understand it. So I think lipid science is evolving. And what I would say is in the majority of our patients that we put on low-carb diets, some of the guys have to go. See ya. So the majority of the patients that we put on um, low-carb diets, we actually see LDL drop. There are a few patients where the LDL does go up. And those are the patients where I check particle size. The other ones I don't even bother. But we see it increase. But what's interesting with all those patients that have their rise in LDL, all the markers of inflammation drop. So every marker, their cardiac CRP, their HDL, their triglycerides, their diabetes, their high blood pressure, everything gets better. And yet sometimes the LDL goes up. So you know, I, I, I struggle. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we're doing something unhealthy or are healthy. So just one parameter goes up, which traditionally was thought of, you know, we think of that as being an, an unhealthy thing. And, and my answer to it is there's more to it. We don't quite understand it. Okay, so we're almost finished. Um, let me just go to uh, patient number two is a female. Um, she's been my patient for, for years. And she comes, um, we've been treating all her medical problems, hypertension, obesity, depression. She's on uh, some medications. We do her uh, OGT, and um, uh, we actually do a one hour. And um, it's not clear what the normal is, so we use a cutoff of 180 for a one, a one hour. I know in pregnant people, they use 140, but for uh, normal population. So she, this one's high, this one's high, over 140, so we call it prediabetes. Her A1C is not terrible. Her cholesterol is high, um, not bad. Her HDL is good. Let's see, her LDL. Uh, whether or not that's up or down, total cholesterol might be a little high. And she meets this criteria for metabolic syndrome. So we treat her with carbohydrate restriction and some supplements. Three years later, she loses 90, 90 pounds. 31% of her body weight is, is lost. We repeat her OGT, and it gets significantly better. Um, is she still insulin resistant? You know, it's just a matter of what you consider the cutoffs to be her A1C drops and her triglycerides, her HDL goes up, triglycerides go down, just like I showed you on those studies, and her LDL drops in this particular case. And she's maintaining her weight loss, and she still needs to lose some more weight. Um, okay, this, this is my patient, David Mendoza, who has a website, and he basically, he's diabetic, and he made a, uh, his, he's a, um, 
a, a writer. And he basically made diabetes his career once he discovered he had it. And he was on a mission to treat and cure his diabetes. And we had met back in 2005 when one of these new drugs, Spieta, had come out. And he, his physician was, was scared to put him on that new medication. And we met over the internet and I said, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll help you out. So um, we meet each other and when he first comes in, he's, uh, his BMI is 40, 312 pounds. He's been diabetic for 11 years. He's only on metformin. And his OGT is consistent with type 2 diabetes. A1C is, is up. Um, and we like to get A1Cs down in diabetics under 6. Um, and then um, he has what we call his metabolic lipid profile. His uh, trigs are up, HDL is down, his LDL is up. And we treat him with carbohydrate restriction and by aid, he's actually the first patient. So two years later, he's really motivated. He loses 49% of his body weight. That's half of himself. And uh, he's a little stubborn. I can't get him back in to do the OGT. But his fasting sugars are normal. His A1C has dropped. His cholesterol, all the numbers are better. Trigs are down. The HDL is up. Total cholesterol down. LDL is down. And we stopped all his medications. And essentially, he doesn't have diabetes anymore. And so this is him now. And I think it's funny, in the first slide, his hobby is um, going to the Met, uh, was it Mesa, 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 Mesa Diner in Boulder? That's where the first picture is. And now he's taking up exercise. Remember we talked about no energy? Now he has tons of energy. So he travels around all, the, all around the world, sending us pictures, and he, he hikes, and he, he does active things. He has energy now to do stuff. And so here's, um, this will be the last patient. And so um, this patient comes in uh, last year, and he's got uh, high cholesterol. I do an OGT. It's actually normal. A1C is um, um, it's not bad. And the question is, well, does he have insulin resistance? Well, I measure C-peptide, and, and that basically uh, is a cleave molecule from uh, it's a pro-insulin molecule, and it tells us about endogenous insulin production. And um, so in diabetics, the C-peptide should be um, under 3.1, but in insulin resistant, um, we use a number of two, and so his number's already in the diabetic range, so even though these other parameters are good, yeah, sure, he's insulin resistant, and so, you know, there's other ways to screen, and that's why we want to measure all the markers. And so his cholesterol is high. Uh, uh, tr treats are not that bad. HDL in a male, um, I guess that's good. It should be over 40 in women over 50. His LDL is way, way high. So we treat him with um, carbohydrate restriction. Seven months later, he loses uh, 45 pounds, 20% body loss. Fasting blood sugar is better. His A1C drops slightly, and his triglycerides get better. And again, LDL drops. I mean, no, no worries. And the guy feels great. And I don't have good pictures of him, but um, he's a uh, radio announcer. He's also the voice of Channel 7. Um, he's, a, he's a neat guy. And you can't see his belly because he's bending over, holding his uh, carbohydrate, heavy cake there. Um, but um, if you look at his face, he did lose 45 pounds, a significant amount of weight. So um, if you want to do some reading, Gary Taubes is um, a brilliant man. Um, we're, we're about the same age. He's a couple years older. And basically, over the, the 10 years, his discovery and my discovery have gone in a, in a parallel universe. And, you know, he writes books and I treat patients, but our understanding of nutrition. And so his books are all about nutrition and the history of bad science. And he's, he's rather hardcore, but um, you have to understand what the basic principles that he's trying to dis, dis, uh, well, prove are incorrect is that, you know, if you eat fat, you get fat. And also this, this idea of conservation of energy. Um, you know, exercise more and eat less, and I'll be just fine. There's just more to it than, than, than that, and I, I hope I've explained that. And so his uh, new book just came out, and this was at the Tattered Cover, his book signing, and I've had a relationship with him for about a year or two now, just because of common interest. So redefining healthy nutrition, we call it Denver's Diet Doctor. What we're trying to do is rebalance the carbohydrate-heavy food pyramid I think any nutritionist out there would agree that there still are problems with that food pyramid where you have all the grain, corn, and wheat products as the base, as the primary fuel that you're supposed to consume. 
tongue. So we're telling patients to make healthy food choices based on the carbohydrate content um, and reducing carbohydrate content. We focus on glycemic index, counting grams of, car uh, grams of carbohydrate, uh, increasing healthy uh, fat and protein in the diet. We want to eat three meals, eat until satisfied, lots of snacks and liquids, support them as they're going through carbohydrate withdrawal initially. Again, quantity, portion, and calories are less important. Uh, we're trying to uh, provide to our patients nutrient-dense foods to lose weight, not restrict foods. Um, hunger and appetite will be controlled. We call that the physiologic ads. And uh, exercise, um, uh, both cardio and weights, 50-50, and carbohydrate restriction prior to activity, which is completely the reverse of what we've been telling patients to do for 60 years if they're going to the gym. What we're trying to do is help most of our patients lose weight. Long-term goals is to prevent and improve health, and healthcare professionals need to embrace nutrition as a significant tool to help patients. And so, like Hippocrates would say, uh, let thy food be thy medicine, and let thy medicine be thy food. And I think that's the message today. Um, again, I have um, a lot of information on my website, and um, you can refer to that or give me a call. Thank you very much for your time. I could take some questions. What sorts of um, diets or books or resources do you give patients for if they want to make changes and you don't have the time to go through, go through everything? Well, number one, um, I try to make time. That's that's what it's all about. And, and uh, we get reimbursed for consulting, so I, I just make that part of what I do. But uh, the resource is simple: the glycemic index. I, I provide them with glycemic index, and then the message is if they want to read further, they want to find uh, scientific books like from Gary Taubes or um, books that talk about we eat too much carbohydrate. Now, everyone is, is in on too much carbohydrate this, too much carbohydrate that, but they're combining everything. You've got to watch your carbs, you've got to watch your fat, you've got to watch your calories, and if you're true to the science, the focus is, again, carbohydrates, glycemic index, counting grams of carbohydrates. Are there any programs, if they want more than a book, that you think are the um, programs that it, Well, here in town, um, it, it's rather unique what we do here about carbohydrate restriction. They can, you know, please refer them to me. And again, the problem with uh, registered dietitians and certified diabetic educators is that they have to rely on guidelines where I have some flexibility in what I do, but if you find a couple of nutritionists, they'll come and talk to me on the side, Dr. Gerber, this is so on, and our official guidelines need to change. And so I'm kind of stuck in this quasi in between, I have to deal with the old and the new, and my goal is to improve my, our patients' health. So it, it is unique what we do, and so there's weight loss clinics, traditional weight loss clinics, which uh, I, I forgot to mention, and, um, but they're, they're based on these extreme carbohydrate, or not, extreme low fat, low calories, eat nothing liquid diets. And, and I think, unfortunately, they contribute to this yo-yo effect, people pay out of pocket. And again, I don't see much. some, and then they're still saying, well, yes, we are doing low carb, but we're doing low carb, low fat, low calorie, don't eat. So it's unique what we do here. Yes, Dr. You Elliot. spinner me? You try to stay away from me. So, um, yes, we can, we can use that. That's a tool, and it, and it does help some people. But in the sense of physiology, it's not quite a physiolo physiologic drug. So it's there. Once these uh, people have lost all their weight, do they need to still maintain a, a low-carb diet? Um, they need to understand that carbohydrates are the fat and fuel and for life. And the beauty of this is when we have patients first come in, all we talk to them about is glycemic index. And we don't necessarily start with carbohydrate or any count. We just say, we want you to now, this is a new way to look at nutrition, a new way to look at food, based on the carbohydrate content of food. And just go out there, and I want you to eat foods that have an index under 30. And don't worry about anything else, and they lose weight. So once they maintain weight, they still need to think about that. And just focus on carbohydrate content. Food. If they were eating foods that had a glycemic index under 30, if they want to maintain weight, well now they can eat foods that have a glycemic index under 50. 
but it really is recommendations for life. And you know, we don't want to contribute to this yo-yo effect. We want to say that what the advice that we give you today is to treat uh, heart disease, diabetes, and for life. Yes? Why is it that um, it means that the carbohydrates should be restricted prior to working out? Right, so, so great question. So uh, the answer is that uh, our patients are going to the gym and specifically the ones that want to lose weight. So um, in the traditional sense, they say, well, you need energy to go to the gym, so you need the carbohydrate load build up your glycogen stores, you have circulating glucose. When you go to the gym, the body is going to preferentially burn the simple fuel, which is the glucose and the carbohydrate. It's not going to touch the body fat. So you're not going to lose weight. And so we tell patients, that's the spinning wheel effect. You know, I go to the gym all the time, and I eat these um, high protein, high carb snacks, lots of caffeine, and I don't lose any weight. Well, it's obvious. You're, you're just pumping the, the primary fuel into your system. So what we have them do it's just the opposite. Restrict carbs prior to going to the gym. You deplete your glycogen stores because your goal is to lose weight. And when you're in there, the body's going to say, whoa, we need some energy, so we're going to look to body fat for energy. And patients don't drop dead in the gym. Patients, you know, energy changes initially, but actually what happens to the patients that do this, and, and I don't even tell them about it. I had a patient a month ago who says, Dr. Gerber, I came in, my energy was here, and now, my energy is not here, Dr. Kerber. My energy went like this. It just leveled off. And I go eat my lunch, and I feel great. And I'm just buzzing along, and I go to the gym, and it just, it just levels out your energy. Yes? Can you work with women during pregnancy for, um, right, so, with the carbohydrates? So that's a great question. and and. and we're still working on the answer on that, but mm -hmm. the, the, the message is being pregnant is not a, um, a ticket to, to eat whatever you want. You still have to eat healthy carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, you know, uh, gestational diabetes is kind of this, this early signal that, that the female will become diabetic later in life. So, you know, we love to see patients after pregnancy who had gestational diabetes so we can coach them for life. But, um, you know, what is the total carbs that, uh, that that the pregnant woman needs. I don't quite know the answer to it, but healthier carbs, you know, and that also leads to, well, you know, the babies, the, the children that are born. And so the message there is, again, healthier carbohydrates. And if you look at, the, the, you know, children are growing, they need more carbohydrate, but not the quantity that we're giving them today. Not the kind, exactly. Excellent questions. So. Okay, I guess time's up. Thank you so much.